Okay, Manushvi, we are live now. We can start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello and namaste. Welcome to the expert live panel discussion organized by Feroptom in association with ASCO. Today we have with us esteemed ophthalmologists in the field of refractive surgery to discuss with us about the different refractive surgeries and what an optometrist needs to know about them. This session is live on YouTube and if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please go ahead and hit the red subscribe button right now. I am Anashvi and I will be moderating the discussion today. So without further ado, let's welcome our panelists. First up from the United States of America, we have Dr. Arun Gulani. Dr. Arun Gulani is the founding director and chief surgeon of the internationally famous Gulani Vision Institute in Jacksonville, Florida, USA. And he is a former chief Chief of Cornea and Refractive Surgery at University of Florida. Listed in Forbes Gold Line Research among top 10 laser vision surgeons in the USA and as one of the most famous eye surgeons in the world with a global clientele, Dr. Gulani is internationally known for his inventions, groundbreaking and innovative surgical techniques and publications. Dr. Gulani has super specialized in advanced LASIK, custom corneal and premium cataract surgery and has uniquely woven this full spectrum of keratolent particular refractive surgery to custom design, and he's among the first in the world to introduce new technologies, techniques, and protocols as a consultant to patients, eye surgeons, and the eye care industry. Dr. Gulani, thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the panel. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Uh, next up, similarly, we have Dr. Ravi Krishna Kanaradi from India. Dr. Ravi Krishna completed his basic medical education from Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Belgaum, in 2001 and post graduation in ophthalmology from prestigious Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Minto Eye Hospital, Bengaluru, in 2006. He was actively involved in developing a rural charitable eye hospital, Sri Sharada Devi Eye Hospital and Research Center, Pavagra, for two years. Then he worked as consultant in the Department of Cataract, Sri Vivekananda Sevashrama Eye Hospital, Bengaluru, and Chief Medical Officer and Senior Consultant Department of Cataract Refractive and Implant Vision Correction Services at Vasan Eye Care Hospital for nine years. He has given speeches, presented papers at several national conferences, and is also actively involved in teaching. His areas of interests include cataract, refractive, and implant vision correction surgeries. He is currently working as a consultant for the same at Narayan Netralaya, Rajajinagar, Bangalore. Dr. Kanaradi, welcome to the panel, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We also have with us Dr. Nitin Malkan from India. Dr. Nitin completed his MS in 1986 and then set up his private practice, Akshar Eye Clinic in Malad, Mumbai, and has now completed 30 years of practice. He is presently the medical director of Akshar Eye Clinic, which is a multi-specialty eye care facility. He is also the medical advisory board member of BABTI Hospital, Kandivali, and chief clinical coordinator and medical director of LM Patel Rotary Eye Hospital, Malad. Dr. Nitin is also uh, the medical director of Universal LASIK and Smile Center, Kandivali. Dr. Malkan has presented several papers and delivered lectures on various subjects in regional ophthalmic conferences and in all India Ophthalmic Congress. He's also a member of ESCRS and has presented papers in the ESCRS Annual Congress. Dr. Malkan, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the panel. Thank you for the invitation. So without further ado, do let's begin the discussion starting with the basic question of course i would ask this to dr nitin first so uh, could you tell us what are the different type of refractive surgeries we have and what kind of surgery benefits what kind of patients well so far as refractive procedures are concerned let us consider it as extraocular procedure and intraocular procedure because cataract surgery also has become a refractive surgery now so far as extraocular uh, procedures are concerned, they are performed on the cornea. And these corneal procedures are photorefractive keratectomy, LASIK, epilasic, LASIK, femto-assisted LASIK surgery, and smile surgery. These are all corneal procedures, refractive procedures. And intraocular procedure includes implantable contact lens, PECIC, 
lenses, the refractive lens exchange with implantation of various type of intraocular lenses, which probably we'll be discussing later on in the uh, question and session. So these are the refractive procedures. And anybody seeking the freedom from glasses is a good candidate for a refractive surgery of any kind, provided it, the, the tissue is not contraindicating the procedure. So there are ways and means to examine the contraindication and it's very important in a refractive surgery when not to do it. If that is understood, all can any age, any type of uh, personality is okay for uh, refractive surgery. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nitin. And Dr. Arun, uh, would you like to add something to he something here? I think Dr. Nitin uh, listed it very well. Um, my take, as you know, is in fact, uh, it's very important you as optometrists should know this, which I absolutely believe you should, is everybody who you are fitting with the glasses is a kind of candidate for refractive surgery. To me, there is no such thing as not a candidate. There is no contraindication at all because contraindications exist because surgeons know only a few techniques, right? Imagine if you knew only how to do 15 kinds of glasses, everybody else would be not a candidate, correct? So there are 48 refractive techniques. In fact, from about 29 years ago, I've always said every surgery in the eye, including retinal surgery is refractive surgery because you cannot leave the patient with a refractive error. So if you look at that mindset, I believe ophthalmologists basically should be doing what optometrists are doing, which is bring every patient to 2020, no excuse. Unless the patient, the only indication or concept is, unless the patient is changing, which could be someone below the age of 20, or pathology like keratoconus, which is changing. And I'll show you how keratoconus also is a refractive surgery, where majority of my patients are 20, 20 without glasses. So my take on this is very much akin to the seminar we are having today with optometrists, which is if you can fit someone with glasses or contact lenses, that patient is a candidate for some surgery. Uh, Dr. Nitin has uh, listed uh, about uh, uh, the surgeries of uh, refractive surgeries like PRK, Femto, and uh, we have something called SVK, Smile, and the technology is on advance. So what are the differences between all these technologies? So you're asking me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Again, if you look at the concept, like I said, 48 techniques, there are 23 laser vision techniques actually. Uh, the techniques that I've honed over the last 30 years, I call it laser plastique now, which is a non-cut surface laser techniques, which are way beyond smile and everything else that's being done in the world. The concept here is if you're not cutting the cornea, the thickness of the cornea doesn't matter. I've proven this repeatedly over the last three decades. It is a misnomer to call somebody short because they are five feet tall. Just think about this concept. Today, what I'll do is I'll make sure everybody understands concepts so they don't live by boxes. In medicine, there is no such thing as cannot do. It is just about relativity. As long as someone is normal, get the job done. So let me give you an example. You cannot take somebody who's five feet tall and say, this is short or this is tall. It's a relative index. If you go to you know, Dutch Netherlands, it's a short person. If you go to Asia, it's a tall person. You get me? As long as you're not talking about acromegaly or dwarfism, that's abnormal. Now you want to talk about what you can and cannot do based on pathology. If you apply that criteria, it is absolute nonsense that doctors have come up with limits of corneal thickness. Having the Lobold's maybe largest practice of fixing complications of refractive surgery. I have yet to see a patient based on corneal thickness who went into a problem. It was a missed diagnosis. So I've done cases which are starting at 200 micron corneas. And these patients today, 20 years later, are still doing great. Again, my point. Every case is individual, so I'm not making a statement, but the important thing I want every eye doctor to understand is there is no such thing as a number. That's where doctors are very confused. 520 is normal, 510 is thin, that is wrong. Is it abnormal? Is it formed for scaredoconus? That's the only thing that people are worried about, correct? If you rule that out, even 480 is normal. In fact, I am known to do lasers on keratoconus for the last two decades, and as you know, these are very high-end patients. These are patients very highly demanding. So if these patients are doing great, I have totally proven the fallacy of thickness of cornea. 
right? So the concept here becomes whether it's SBK you call PRK, like I told you, there are 23 laser vision techniques on the cornea. When you take all these spectra in what I have defined as clear, K-L-E-A-R, Kereto lenticulo extended armamentarium of refractive surgery. 48 techniques which makes every eye surgeon a vision corrective surgeon. All right, and I'll show you a few slides. I wasn't aware of questions until today morning, but I've also made slides for you to show you how these patients react and that bringing them to 2020 is absolutely our duty. They're both right. Thank you, Dr. Arun. I will be seeing the slides. For sure, you're welcome. I'll take all of you. Go ahead with your next questions. Want to make sure you're all, you know, for time we are all here. All right, uh, Dr. Ravi Krishna. Uh, I would like to ask uh, you the next question. So we have just highlighted on the advancement of the corneal refractive surgery. So uh, what would you say uh, about the advances seen in the technology of cataract surgery? Uh, well, uh, see, uh, there are a lot of things which are evolved in like, uh, keratoconeal refractive surgery. So uh, like earlier it was PRK, then came the flap, then femto, now the smile. So a lot of things have diff like advanced and even diagnostic wise. For example, earlier uh, the basic uh, topography used to be used and we used to do the surgery. Before that, we used to just take keratometry and anterior corneal topography and we used to do the surgery. Nowadays, like uh, we have uh, instruments which will tell us how, how is the corneal anterior surface, how is the corneal posterior surface, how is the corneal biomechanics. So all these things will be taken into consideration before we take the patient for keratorefractive surgery. So a lot of advanced things have come. Uh, we are learning like refractive surgeries every day, new, new things are coming. So we are learning every day the newer things. So, and uh, one more thing is like uh, uh, recovery wise also, like PRK patient used to have a lot of pain, all those things. Now with the flap, with the smile, the recovery is very fast. Uh, patient is uh, having very less symptoms. So, and one more thing is in case if there are any complications, we can diagnose it early, either by clinical examination or else with these diagnostic instruments. So this is the newer thing, basically, whatever. So are. what would you say are the differences uh, for our audiences? What would you say are the differences between these techniques, the femto, the SVK, the PRK, the SMILE? See, ultimately, uh, all these procedures will be correcting the uh, refractive error. Of there course. is no doubt. But uh, the amount of tissue it takes, the recovery-wise, uh, patient satisfaction-wise, so obviously PRK is having like patient will experience more of pain and blurred vision and uh, they will have contact lens, more of foreign body sensation, everything. As it goes to next uh, like flap, uh, either femto or uh, microkeratome related or else uh, the next is a smile. But like patient uh, recovery wise, satisfaction wise, obviously the smile is more uh, rewarding compared to PRK. Well, I would like to add a few things here to clarify for the optometrists. Can I go ahead? Yeah, please, please sir. Definitely. Yeah, uh, let us make it simple because uh, many a times the terms are not understood for the optometrists who are not exposed to this procedure or they have not seen this procedure. So, PRK means a laser is Uh, hello, Dr. Nitin. Uh, uh, we're not able to hear you, actually. No. Not really. 
Uh, we shall uh, be moving forward while Dr. Nitin uh, fixes the audio. So, uh, uh, Dr. Arun said sky is the limit and I know uh, anybody who can go for spectacles and contact lenses can go for refractive surgery, corneal refractive surgery, basically. So, uh, Dr. Ravi Krishna, anything that you have to uh, say for that? Who can and who can't go for refractive corneal surgery procedures uh, in case of India? Uh, refractive surgery, there are basically three uh, three things. One is corneal related. It's also called as keratorefractive surgery. Second one is uh, implantable collamer lens. It's a add-on lenses, basically. Third thing is the we have a natural lens, which can be removed, and we can place a new lens inside. This is lens-based refractive surgery. There are three things. So I'm uh, expert in uh, ICLs as well as refractive mm -hmm. lens surgery. I used to do a lot of PR case and femto earlier. Now I have stopped. I'm mainly concentrating on the second and third procedures. So, uh, for example, patient is having good corneal thickness with a lesser power. Like in India, we usually practice uh, doing this refractive surgery, like PR case less than six diopter uh, photorefractive keratometry for the patient who is having the uh, spherical error of less than six. We do that. And regarding smile and uh, femto procedures, it basically depends on the corneal thickness. We can do, go till around eight. That is what I have done personally. Uh, in case if the power is more than that and uh, corneal thickness is less, then the next procedure comes into picture that is implantable collamer lens in which a contact lens kind of thing will be placed inside the eye between the iris and the natural lens. Then third thing is, for example, uh, if ICLs are available till the power of around 18 to 20. So if the power is more than that, if you say around minus 22, patient is wearing glasses of minus 22 diopter. So uh, it's better to do a clear lens extraction. And that too, if the retina, everything is perfectly healthy. And I prefer to do this clear lens extraction with the intraocular lens mm -hmm. after the age of 40, just to prevent any retinal related problem in future. This is what I practice at my place. Uh, I believe we have Dr. Nitin back with us. Uh, so, uh, sir, you were uh, talking to us about the differences between the technology of different refractive uh, corneal procedures. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Right. So, just to simplify for the understanding of the optometrist, that PRK, where we give this uh, laser on the surface and we burn the surface of the cornea and the stromal tissue and then allow it to regenerate. This creates little discomfort post-operatively. Not that this procedure is not used, it is indicated in many situations. Then the, to reduce the discomfort on the part of the patient and to minimize the tissue burning, now what we do is take a flap of the superficial corneal layer. Uh, that flap is taken almost 100 micron or 90 micron flap is taken with a hinge, either on the nasal side or superior side. And you reflect the flap and then give laser on the stroma. And at the end of the procedure, you put back the flap. So this completes the procedure. This is known as a LASIK. And uh, PRK, LASIK, now this flap can be taken with a steel blade with the help of the lathe machine or microkeratome or this flap can be made with the help of the femtosecond laser where you don't need any blade. The femtosecond one laser runs through the depth of the cornea and creates a flap and then you reflect the flap and give the laser then essentially the remaining procedure remains the same. So that is known as uh, femto created flap, femtolasic in short, what we call it. Now, when you cut the flap, you all know that cornea is very heavily supplied with the sensory nerves. Slight injury to the cornea results into tremendous discomfort on the part of the patient. Here, you are completely shivering all around the cornea. So all the nerves are damaged. So when you put back the flap, it takes some time for regeneration. Now, whenever 
you have some insult of the cornea, you immediately get watering of the eye. Now, this watering occurs because of the intact messaging through the nerves. That messaging is disrupted because of the destruction of the nerves. So, the patient does not feel the sensation and hence the watering becomes less and that is what we call as dry eye. So, it results into dry eye which remains for two months to one year and then gradually the nerves regenerate and dry eye goes away. Now, these issues associated with flap making. The procedure came known as small lenticular extraction, wherein you don't have to cut the entire cornea. You just make a small pocket in the cornea without cutting the flap. You separate the deeper tissue in the stroma and remove that layer of thin lenticule from the cornea. And at the end of the procedure, you have hardly cut open through a three millimeter incision and all the nerves are spared. This results into a speedy recovery and you feel as if nothing is done. The next day patient is fine. That is smile, which is a advancement in the uh, refractive surgery. So this is just, I wanted to uh, make it simple for your understanding all those who are not exposed to this procedure. Thank you, Dr. Nitin. Dr. Arun, what uh, would you say are the roles of an optometrist in a refractive surgery? Tremendous. Uh, the role is tremendous and uh, very integral because, uh, first of all, you've seen the patient much before, right? For many years, you've done glasses and contacts with them. So the patient themselves get to know you, you get to know the patient. So the most important thing I mentioned for optometrists is I want to know that their refractions and their entire measurements have been stable, right? There's another misnomer about age when you can do surgery. So without going into all those things that I talk about on uh, surgical podiums, to keep it simple, optometrists most important have taken care of patients for such a long time. Then when they bring the patient to you, they're letting you know about stability, what's going on with the patient, what are the expectations? Second, during surgery, I even like optometrists to be involved in the participation of selection of surgery. You, as you know, if you read my work, I absolutely refuse to let doctors do things like in the box. I do this when I do this, I do this when I, completely wrong. I'll show you cases where patients have 90 keratometry I have corrected, 29 diopter astigmatisms corrected, because again, you look at it as a thing to design around, right? You don't accept defeat and go, this patient has 49 keratometry, I can't do anything. You're wrong. You can do anything because now you want a flattening procedure. You can even combine techniques. Dr. Ravi very eloquently mentioned the intraocular procedures and Dr. is an extraocular. You can even combine. You can even play them in stages. I'll show you all that later. So optometry has a great role before surgery. In surgery, to get involved in deciding what technique, technology to pick up. There are 35 lens technologies. From there on, you also are involved in the post-op. Now, there are two levels of post-op in optometry. One, most of these patients are, if they're routine cases, they're doing great. Some of them are the very difficult cases. For example, when I do patients of, uh, let's say, very high regular astigmatism or over 30 diopters, keratometry, 89 diopters, there I stage them. Where I correct them to the best visual potential surgically, let's say 2040, which is amazing for the patient. But I then have the optometrist put a scleral contact lens which is magnificent to bring them to 2025 vision. So optometry has a role at all three levels, not just the pre and post-op, all three levels of refractive surgery. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arun. Dr. Nitin, would you like to add anything here? Uh, what Dr. Gulani has said is perfectly correct. Of course, the views are diagonally opposite about the selection criteria. Uh, so that we'll discuss as and when the issue comes up. Uh, about the role of the optometrist, as he said, it's tremendous. I cannot do my refractive surgery without my optometrist because the moment patient walks in the clinic and whether he's with you or not with you, when you examine the patient right from the history, you know, everywhere your involvement is there. And you know that in refractive surgery, what you do is correction of refraction. So if refraction is not corrected properly, you will end up feeding the wrong data to the computer. And you may end up with some refractive surprise. So from there, your role starts. 
and before the doctor declares whether this patient is fit or unfit which are my criteria for selection which are quite different than what dr gulani is talking about because he has there is no contraindication and i see many contraindications so uh, as an optometrist when patient discusses about the refractive surgery you have to find out whether this is a right suitable candidate for the refractometry or not i mean refractive surgery or not so how do you find out about it you have to understand the corneal tissue and you should be exposed to something what is known as corneal topography you must understand the play of colors on corneal topography machine and topography alone is not sufficient you have to do tomography that is pentacam or cirrus or whichever instrument you have but it is a tomography so tomography also should be known by the optician the optometrist before going to this investigations my dietic refraction has to be very well known to the optometrist you cannot have loose and sear about examination so perfect refraction undilated and dilated then subjecting the patient to topography to pentacam let the posterior segment examination uh, uh, be done by the ophthalmologist where there are some contraindications for doing the uh, surgery but otherwise planning complete involvement of the optometrist is needed not up to there then right inside the operation theater also my optometrist feeds the entire data in the machine discusses pros and cons about so many small little things of measurement of the optic zone to you know you pill the angle kappa angle alpha how to plan the treatment everywhere there is a role of optometrist and then post operative the refractive error is gone but there are small little issues here and there which optometrist must understand so that if the vision is hazy for first week or two weeks in prk you should know that that yes that happens and it gradually improves so that you are not disturbed when the patient says that i can't see well so you have to understand post operative recovery of each and every procedure very well and if you have understood the subject properly then you can answer the patient so i see a tremendous role of optometrist in the lasix i mean in the corneal refractive surgery Uh, thank you, Dr. Nitin. Uh, Dr. Ravi Krishna. Uh, for optometrists, I just want to simplify this refractive surgery. See, basically, we have two refractive uh, parts. One is called cornea, other one is natural lens. Cornea is around forty diopters, approximately, and uh, lens is around twenty diopters. For example, a patient who is wearing minus five, that means his total power of the eye is around sixty-five diopters. He is using minus five to make it sixty, yeah. so he has around five extra. So that can be removed from the cornea. That will become a keratorefractive procedure, or else we can introduce a minus lens inside the eye. That will become a ICL or uh, IPCL, which is an Indian version, or else we can remove that part from the natural lens. So that will become a refractive lens surgery. So this is a simplified version of this. refractive procedures overall uh, so uh, what would you say are the roles of uh, opt- an optometrist in refractive surgeries see uh, most of the refractive surgery except surgery is hmm. done by optometrist so starting that's what uh, what uh, so uh, what special of course please continue sir yeah what i nitin sir said so from the refraction then doing the scan then entering the data in the mission and operating the mission and seeing post operative vision so like for example they would have seen the patient from the start like they would have done refraction for that patient dilatory refraction then they would have scan done the scan then in the ot they would have entered then they will see the refractive outcomes how is like how each surgery uh, the outcome is like prk or whatever any of these refractive procedures so they'll be able to understand in a better way one and like i personally feel that optometrist are one of the uh, major supporting system 
for any of the refractive setup not only like uh, surgery kind of thing it's basically entire refractive setup optometrist can uh, learn many things they can learn about many of these missions if they are even interested so obviously their role is very very important and they have like they can uh, invest their more time and then ca- they can learn many things um dr ravi krishna so uh, what special precautions does a patient need to take after the surgery after these uh, refractive corneal surgeries uh, like you are asking me about the routine post op uh, care yes or- yes sir uh like they are not supposed to take head bath and wash their face for a week one and uh, in case if they feel that their vision is coming down or something like, like they are experiencing more pain after two or three days then they should come to hospital and third thing is uh, they should avoid going out especially uh, under like sunlight in case of prk at least for uh, one month because sometimes it might induce some haze haze is like uh, the corneal uh, haziness which can appear in prk when we treat high power and uh, then fourth thing is uh, uh, like whatever medic medications we give like especially steroids uh, steroid we give it for a month in some patient we might give it for two months they should come uh, at least uh, once in two weeks or three weeks for their eye checkup sometimes what happens some of these people are more prone for steroid response like we call them as steroid responders in which their intraocular pressure goes up so these all, uh, all these things has to be monitored and one uh, whenever the eye pressure goes up patient might experience pain as well as blurred vision so they should come back to the hospital and driving all these things should be avoided for at least for a week thank you dr ravi krishna dr arun gulani so what are the special precautions that a patient needs to take after the refractive corneal surgeries again very well said by dr ravi uh, it all depends on the surgery most of my patients fly out next day uh, the prk technique that i've been doing laser plastic i just spoke about yesterday there is no pain with the surgery so there are a lot of things that are variant in the way people practice um intraocular surgery uh, phacic implants uh, corneal surgery they all can fly out next day uh basically concepts that i like to share about i tell them is now it's your responsibility all right this way you make them very clear that this was a surgery it's not a fly by night procedure so yes avoid direct sunlight too much going into the pool for about a week after a week i let everybody do anything they want for cataract surgery basically one day of rest Uh, again they can fly the same day one day of rest and they're done what i'll do for you is i put together some slides so you can understand my concept of refractive surgery where like i said to me even a retinal surgeon is a refractive surgeon i hold them accountable i don't want anyone to tell me retinas flat i'm like damn it you induced myopia by putting the damn buckle get that done so <laughs> my point is all of us are vision corrective surgeons i do not like this difference between corneal lasik cataract surgeon it's one thing we are all here for vision right so again why it's so important uh, when i accepted your invitation i think very highly of optometrists because you guys are actually delivering vision what we are doing is doing it surgically so as long as an ophthalmologist understands that they understand their responsibility you cannot take a patient the optometrist has refracted to 2010 and deliver 2020 it's failure so these are concepts i love to share uh, with colleagues and as optometrists you have responsibilities too your refraction has to be mind blowing uh, i refract my patients till today personally none no patient can go to surgery until i refract them and i chase 2010 i'm never happy with 2020 cuz uh, i'm blessed with 2010 vision so every patient of mine none of them no matter where they fly to me from can undergo surgery until i streak retinoscope them with or nine different topographers here's the fun thing i'll let you know and you know this best as optometrists Keratoconus diagnosis is a refractive diagnosis, not a topographic diagnosis. By the time you see topography, it's like seeing an X-ray with pneumonia. You should have the acumen to pick up the rals in the base. What, what do I mean by that? Stigmatism against the rule. High keratometry, relatively thin cornea. Boom. You know it's keratom- keratoconus. I don't care what the topography looks like. And change your technique accordingly. All right? So what I'll do now is I'll take you through a few slides to share the concept. Then I can be here a few more minutes answering questions. Can I share the screen please? Yes sir. Thank you. (laughs) 
post disabled sharing screen. Can you see it now? No, I no. cannot see. It says the host has to screen? allow. Host has to give the permission. Yeah, can you check, please? Uh, of course. Um, requesting the organizer to allow the screen sharing. Host has disabled sharing. No. You should be able to share, sir. No. Thank you. I've already shared it. Can you see? No, sir, not yet. Okay, one small. How about now? No, sir. Not it. Okay, hold on. Yeah, now I can see you enabled it. How, how yes, about sir. now? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah? Perfect. So here we go. Can you see it now? Yes, sir. Okay, lovely. So here's a very profound statement. And um, what I always believe in, and I teach with tremendous passion, is everyone is a candidate. Nobody is not a candidate. That's a misnomer based on techniques. I want all of you to look at these top row of slides. All of these patients are 2020. None of them have had transplants. None of them are wearing glasses or contacts. So please take in those top corneal looks that you have there, right there. And all of these patients that you see down here are day one post-op from uh, nine countries, 11 states, all 2020. My point, none of these cases that you see up should be sent home with you are impossible or too irregular. This is a patient experience that I also emphasize. And if you saw my recent article in Ophthalmology Times, I'll share with you. I call it, show me the patients. You know, there are doctors who show these surgeries on stage with this silly vitreous maneuvers, stitches in the lenses. All those patients are flying to me wanting to sue these surgeons. Problem is they missed the point. Patient came for vision, not for surgical acrobatics, right? <laughs> the experience is very important. Extremely important. Again, optometrist understands this by being part of it. This was my recent article in Ophthalmology Times, and here we are. How do I think? I always think no matter how difficult the case is, whether I'm doing a 32 incision radial keratotomy cornea, uh, 90 diopter keratometry keratoconus, a completely dense herpetic scar in the center, I'm always thinking 2020, always vision. Then I think about surgery, what technique among 48 techniques or among 112 combinations am I picking? Then last I think of technology because I, I, I concern that like as if we go to the kitchen and pick up our ingredients. And then you do your master chef part, right? And the most important time spent is in planning, as you can see me do there. That is the most important time in any surgery. This is the concept. I call it the 3T technique, technique, technology, target. And there the optometrist can help you by telling you what's the target of vision that that patient is used to. There are about 35 lens implant technology in the US. There are about 80 plus all over the world that are approved. So use these as ingredients. Don't talk about or advertise. I said this yesterday in a very big webinar. Stop advertising lenses. If you advertise lenses, it's like you're advertising ingredients. You're the master chef. Take credit for amazing outcomes. Also take responsibility for wrong outcomes. So you can never blame the lens. And I'll say this to you in a fun way. If you had patients, this is about more for Dr. Nitin and Ravi, is a happy patient with a premium cataract surgery will praise the lens, right? They'll say, my husband bought this amazing multifocal lens for me. I'm seeing all distances. An unhappy patient of premium cataract surgery will blame the surgeon. So again, there's no need to talk about the lens. You are the master chef. Take credit for that amazing outcome. I believe tremendously in show me the patient concept. You'll see every video, every talk of mine, anywhere on the world podium, I show the patients because I believe if you cannot show me your patient, your work is unreal. I don't believe in statistics and charts and hidden scattergrams. Real patients who are on Facebook saying that you're amazing, that's the fact of success. So here's another important thing one of you had asked me before and I thought I'll bring it to you. This is an everyday scenario at my office, uh, patients who want selfies, pictures. This is important. The patient is telling you in subtle way that they had a mind blowing experience and great vision. You don't need to show a scattergram to anybody. And this is an every Friday where groups of patients fly out from my institute, not now with COVID, but 
This is what I want every eye surgeon to be inspired by. We are talking about patient experience and vision, not about surgery. No patient comes to you with saying, give me surgery, doctor. They say, I can't see. These are modern day patients. These are, this is my patient again, a pingecular patient. So doctor, as optometrist, you'll see pingecula and pterygium, right? Quite a few of these. My, I just published a book on this, a textbook. Every patient of ours next day is made to walk to the mirror. Their eyes should be so flawless and painless. And these are the patients and how they hold you accountable as doctors. They go on their social media and keep posting every month. Imagine, even a plastic surgeon doesn't have this level of uh, uh, what do you call uh, accountability. As an eye doctor, I get these photos from my patients every day, every month, literally, because they're so obsessed. So even if they see a red spot after surgery, the doc, is there something wrong? And you go, no. But it's a small price to pay for the fact that you want sparkling eyes and you want these patients to look beautiful. I hear a patient the next day post up from pterygium surgery, if you can see their eyes, crystal clear white, and the patients want to stare in the mirror, keep on looking at themselves, and this is the future. The future I discussed 30 years ago for cataract, now they're calling it refractive nonsense. Nobody came to you for cataract, they came because they could not see, right? Same way for pterygium pingecula, you want the patient to look sparkling white with zero recurrence, and we have an 18 year study that was just published. Then here's the book, just in case you'll need to look at it online. It's theme publishers. This is surgery, but given the time limit, we'll keep going. Uh, here are patients. This is a patient with plus nine hyperopia, plus seven astigmatism, nystagmus with uh, strabismus flown from South Africa. In fact, she was my first patient after COVID when we reopened two months ago. And you see, I've designed an instrument to hold the eyeball. This is the laser surface technique that I've been doing majority of the cases that beats smile, LASIK, everything hands down. And the question later we can discuss is how the hell can you correct plus nine and plus seven? You can. It's the fun of spherical equivalence that eye surgeons still haven't understood. They're still looking at topographies and refraction. As optometrists, you get it. Spherical equivalent and you play with the laser, fool the optics and bring these patients to 20-20 vision. So you can even see how thick her glasses and how bad her system was. Just take a look at the face. Can you see that? And that was nystagmus while I was operating during laser. I want you to look at all these corneas for doctors who say this can't be done. Each of this patient is seeing 2020 without glasses, without contacts. Each <clears throat> of this patient. And the keratometry was mind blowing, right? From 49 to 68 to 90s in these cases, the refraction, people call irregular cornea. Another myth that I blast all over the world there is no such thing as irregular, irregular cornea. Uh, for the optometrist, it's a diagnosis as smart as upset stomach or bad headache. It's not logical. Irregular cornea is just an eye doctor who's lazy enough not to have measured deep enough what the real problem is. So all these patients are 20-20. Scar techniques. All these patients with scars for the last 20 years I've been doing laser plastique, which is a way of creating scars as a practice surgery. As Dr. Ravi and Dr. Nitin rightly mentioned, it's all about shape, right? If you look at the scar, look at the shape. I call these incornea scars and straight to 2020 vision. This is another a patient I'm just showing you next day post up of incornea scar with a high irregular stigmatism, traumatic scar. Look at the patient next day, the video he sent me on Facebook. Could this patient have done this with any surgery or transplant that his surgeons in New York told him was his only option? So I want everybody to be inspired by these things because this is the patient outcome that is the most amazing way to measure success, <laughs> not statistics. I could go crazy sitting here telling you everyone's 2020, but all our patients are on social media explaining their outcomes. That is high accountability. These are what I call clown suit or on corneal scar. You can peel them off. And even eight years later, do toric premium cataract surgery, keep them 2020 for life, just like an optometrist does. Again, no limits to astigmatism. Here you can see a patient from Abu Dhabi referred to me, 10.5 astigmatism down to 0.3. This is very important. Again, high keratoconus. How did this patient come to 0.3 from 10.1 astigmatism? Here's another patient. Over 20 diopter astigmatism, look at the irregularity. There is no such thing. Start measuring, start planning, and start performing. Again, no limits here. This is in fact a patient, he was working for Bosch and Lamps, a new every eye doctor in the, in the world, literally. His only seeing herpes scarred eye. I repeat, only seeing eye with herpes central scar. 
why, what am I doing here? I'm doing what an optometrist done. I start refracting him. The only thing ophthalmologists did not do for him, start refracting him and bring him to an outcome. And here he is, 2020. Patient with dense pseudomonas scar from contact lenses. What would you do? <coughs> Note, I need a young girl here. And now she's a model with this surgery. Again, surface laser surgery, take the scars straight to 2020 vision. What would you do with these patients? As an optometrist, you see these in your office, right? RK cuts on the cornea, high regular astigmatism. Again, just correct the shape. You'll be surprised all these patients can see and see very well despite the cuts. Look at these scarred RK cases. This is a I'm just going past the surgery, then intact. Various kinds of intracorneal rings that are available for patients with keratoconus. Now, all of you see keratoconus patients, correct? As optometrists. Do not just put them in a contact lens. Please get them surgically corrected first, and I'll tell you why. There are about 20 different techniques in which I call think outside the cone. Concept of taking keratoconus patients to 2020 vision. So you can see here, bringing the astigmatism down from 10.1 to 2.7. Even LASIK ectasias can be corrected and then laser on top of the intacts because once you put an intact in a cone, you have strengthened the cornea with a brace, correct? Now you can shape it with a few microns and bring them to 2020 vision. And that's the importance of these cases. Patients with a broken intact ring when they're sent to me or Kera rings or Ferrara ring from anywhere in the world. Again, that doesn't matter. If the patient's being great, just laser on top of it and you can see these patients doing great. So the patient from Egypt came in with a 365 degree ring, what is called a Keter ring, and was corrected with a laser. Now here's a patient with 23.5 diopter astigmatism. For those of you who may not know these surgeries, this is called a hexagonal keratotomy. You know, RK was done for nearsightedness. Hex K was done for farsightedness. So this patient was sent to me with 23 diopter astigmatism, nearly 90 diopter keratometry. We put a ring around the cuts and then went in the eye and exchanged the lens to 2020 vision. Levels of transplants that can be done for patients to bring them or correct the cornea after less than 100 microns and severe scarring. DSEC, DMEC, all of you know about this. That is also refractive surgery to me because you do it without stitches and plan it by topography. These are epicarotophakias. <coughs> cross-linking. All of you know about cross-linking, correct? Here's my concept of cross-linking that should be very important and understood. Do not put keratoconus patients into cross-linking. <laughs> Why? If you look at keratoconus, think of it as the left side of this picture. You see the bent spine, correct? I call that keratoscoliosis. Basically, it's a bent spine, right? Now, imagine putting cement, the red material, on it and saying, your bent spine will not progress anymore. Well, that's a very stupid thing to do because now you have kept the spine bent forever. So imagine when you're sending your patients for keratoconus cross-linking. You're actually maiming them, disabling them forever. Unless the keratoconus is changing, patient is less than 20 years of age. Besides that, if you're cross-link without correcting, you're doing a disfavor to the patient. See on the right side, the correct thing to do, straighten the spine with surgery about, like I mentioned, 20 techniques with think outside the cone, then put cement or cross-link it, and the patient's always, always gonna thank you for the rest of their life. So you can cross-link in all these conditions. Faking implants of various kinds can be used. Intraocular lenses can be used to correct patients. Even scarred patients can undergo premium cataract surgery once you correct the cornea. This is amniotic surgery to correct surface irregularities and put an ICL to 2020 vision. Combination surgery. Put in an intact and keratoconus, decrease the keratometry, put in a toric lens in the eye, and the patient's done. As you can see here. I'll again go through the videos fast because of uh, time. Can you see that? Going on to other cases, if they've had very bad outcomes off cataract surgery, you can still correct them with the laser. Here's a patient with 12 previous badly done surgeries on keratoconus. Patient had PDK, PRK, LASIK, uh, intacts, uh, cross-linking, uh, has initial keratoconus. You can see the cataract also developing in the eye. Again, it's very easy to get scared looking at these things. But think like an optometrist, what would you do? You do have an option to correct their vision, correct? 
What would you do as an optometrist? You would still start thinking, what do I do? Do I put a contact lens, piggyback contact lens? Can I plan it with prisms? So many options. Same an ophthalmologist, I expect them to do. So when I look at these cases, I do not count the number of surgeries they've had before they came to me. I do not ask them who the surgeon is. Stop blaming people, take charge. So because the cornea was stable here, I went in and removed the ICL and the cataract and then did laser on top of the cornea because remember the intacts are holding my keratoconus cornea so I'm not scared of anything and proceed to 2020 vision. Here's that patient again, lack of time, we'll just proceed quick. You saw the ICL coming out, then the cataract comes out and then the toric lens goes in and then I'm doing laser patient 2020. And that's the progression. This is also important. I call this progressing with the patients so they understand as optometrists, remember what you do, right? You try different contacts or you plan them over the years. This patient understands staged surgery and that's how you take them to their 2020 vision. I bring you back to the slide that even complications can be corrected to 2020. There are no limits, no limits. If the hurdle is nine feet, you cannot say I only jump six feet tall, so I'm not gonna try. You jump 9.1. It's okay if you crash, try jumping 9.1. So we're back to the most important slide. We do all of this for the patients, correct? As optometrists, as ophthalmologists, we cannot say no, and there is no such thing as not a candidate. So with that, I'll end my presentation and uh, we can again open up for questions. I'll stop sharing the screen now. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Arun. Uh, moving back towards the panel discussion, I would uh, like to ask Dr. Nitin here, what are the changes that a patient can experience after the LASIK surgery in regards to quantity and the quality of vision? Well, the patient who undergoes the LASIK surgery or refractive surgery is not happy with the glasses and they have experienced the vision without glasses, how blur it is, whether hypermetropic or myopic and astigmatism. Once you remove the refractive error and they can start seeing with the glasses, more than 99.99% .99 of the patients have a wow factor. They're so happy seeing. The, so most of them are very happy provided you have counseled them properly because so far as the role of optometrist is concerned, we are forgetting one preoperative checkup, which is a must, is a dry eye. You have to do all dry eye tests for all the patients undergoing refractive surgery, rule it out. If there is a presence of aqueous deficiency or uh, evaporative dry eye, you have to treat it and then do the refractive surgery. Then they are very happy, otherwise you know, that if the dry eye gets accentuated after the red six surgery and they don't have a clear vision, even they have clear vision, they are not happy because of the pricking sensation and excessive watering, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have taken care preoperatively, then all these patients have a wow factor after the surgery. They're very happy. Uh, you had talked about a, a certain contraindications that you take into factor while uh, before going before taking the patient for the refractive surgery. So could you highlight uh, those for us? Yeah. See, the whole exercise starts when the patient walks in for the, the you know consultation. So careful preoperative evaluation, as we have already discussed. We have to exclude the clinical extra, uh, you know, the contraindications, which are there. But as Dr. Gulani puts it, he does not consider any contraindications, but they are there. You judge the motivation level of the patient. There are some youngsters, and when they walk in with the glasses, you always feel that, okay, let us suggest the uh, refractive surgery. But if they are not motivated enough, then it is no point going for the uh, refractive surgery. So look for the motivation level. If it is not there, it is a contraindication. Explain the technique, discuss it in detail. For that, you have to know the technique. You have to see the actual surgeries. How are they done? Then you can speak in a better way. So explain the technique, discuss the pros and cons, explain them what they will experience postoperatively, warn them about some operative complications which can happen sometimes. Most of the time it is a very safe procedure and you come out very nicely. 
but you must explain the patient exclude i don't take any high demanding patients for the refractive surgery when they have un uh, reasonable expectations no i don't perform the refractive surgery on them because you you, you can't guarantee anything in any surgery you know because uh, a child is born without a hand or a leg you know a baby is born sometimes where you don't have anything in your hand so surgeon does everything with good intention but patient may not all the 100% of the patients may not get expected result so you should explain that beforehand and if they are not ready to take it then it is contraindicated you know the you have to discuss all the procedures and offer them everything prk femtosecond smile if there is a high power and corneal thickness is not available you talk about icl ipcl clear lens exchange you know and uh, you take the informed concept and there is something like night myopia the operated patients have a difficulty looking at you know outside in the in the dim light situation that happens it remains for some time and then they start feeling better so this night myopia should also be explained beforehand of course it is not a contraindication then if there is a family history of diabetes <coughs> i'm sorry if the patient is herself or himself is a diabetic and it's a contraindication in my clinic if they are suffering with autoimmune conditions it's a contraindication if they are suffering with glaucoma it's a contraindication then keratoconus not all keratoconus are contraindicated and if it is a very advanced cone and if, when you are not planning any other procedure to regularize the cornea like keratoring what doctor has shown and the cross linking if everything can be combined then fine it's not a absolute contraindication but it is a relative contraindication you should be doing all this procedure in your clinic then yes one can go ahead and do it and then uh, some maculopathies you know they have the comorbidity on the retina so they are not expecting good vision once you remove the uh, refractive error they can see well but that level of 20 20 vision cannot come because they have comorbidities you know so general medical history like diabetes and uh, pregnancy if the lady is pregnant you cannot operate because there are changes in refraction because of the hormonal changes expected so you can't operate on a patient who is pregnant you know you have to wait for the delivery to happen then wait for a six months one year to for the stable refraction and then only only do it in any patient where the refractive error is not stable and you see your two or three years record and every time you find a change in the refraction this is also a contraindication but a relative contraindication you can explain the patient about the change of the refractive error afterwards and if that happens you have to go for enhancement so the patient should be fully informed about all these things you know then endocrine pathologies like thyroid uh, we, we don't take the patient for of thyroid for our refractive surgery that is a contraindication in my practice then neurological pathologies like myasthenia lead closure then there are some objective examinations which would definitely rule out the refractive surgery like the uh, patient is on a contact lens wear and there is a lot of warpage and the cornea is scarred uh, you know one, one has to be very tactful about suggesting the refractive surgery then one eyed patient i don't do refractive surgery in a one eyed patient because i don't want to take even 0.5% of a chance of anything going wrong so that is a contraindication for my practice then herpes skinner simplex keratitis repeated attacks herpes zoster re- recurrent uveitis patient corneal erosion syndrome recurrent corneal erosion chronic blepharitis dry eye severe dry eyes allergies glaucoma any past history of corneal surgery or vitrectomy all these are the contraindications in my practice 
Thank you, Dr. Nitin. Uh, that was elaborately and eloquently put, of course. Dr. Ravi Krishna, I would like to ask you, currently <laughs> we see many questions regarding uh, ectasia due to LASIK or any refractive corneal surgery. So what do you have to say about that? Oh my God. So currently we see uh, many discussions regarding ectasia due to LASIK or uh, other refractive corneal surgery. So what do you have to say about that? See, basically, this ectasias can happen because one, pure operated in a cornea which is weaker, or else pre keratoconus stage or keratoconus because of inadequate diagnostic modalities, or like might be not having those advanced in which which will detect these cases. Little Entercam has a bad score by which we'll come to know whether uh, the <laughs> Uh, cornea is stable or not, uh, cornea is weak or not. So one is that. Second thing is some of the patients, like special ladies during pregnancy, their cornea becomes weak, like collagen stretching will happen. So that can, those type of patient can go in for uh, ectasias. Third thing is patient who are having uh, uh, like connective tissue disorders. Uh, they are the candidates who can uh, go in for uh, this ectasias. So this is what uh, I have seen in my practice. So uh, like uh, basically preoperative uh, diagnostic modalities and picking up the correct selected clay cases, like perfect cases without any pre-existing corneal weakness. That is one of the very, very important thing which we should take into consideration. Thank you, Dr. Ravi Krishna. Dr. Arun Gulani, so uh, what do you have to say regarding the ectasia due to LASIK? So the one very important thing um, is a message that most doctors need to understand. Is they're always talking about LASIK. That's a backward way of thinking. If you have only one surgery, then everybody is indication, contraindication. Think about 48 techniques I just mentioned. If you think about it like an optometrist, there is nobody who doesn't deserve glasses. I absolutely qualify that with a very simple kindergarten statement. If the refraction is changing, patient is pregnant or patient is underage, below 19, of course, you got to be careful, look for stability. Barring that, there is no contraindication, according to me. I have done cases for 30 years. I've shared <laughs> them. And the problem is most doctors always, always talk like this. I have a burger. How do I serve this for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And I won't serve it to someone who has this, this, and this. The concept is wrong. You're a master chef. Everybody who comes hungry to you, you prepare the meal accordingly with ingredients that are unlimited. If you think that way, this whole fallacy of contraindication is zero. I do cases of immune suppression throughout the world. I have done thyroid exophthalmopathy all the time, cancer patients, even patients with amblyopia. You just saw the South African girl. She was flown to me with amblyopia, nystagmus, plus nine hyperopia, plus seven stigmatism. The concept is you design the surgery. The problem, again, as optometrists, I don't want you to go home with the wrong concept. There is no such thing as not a candidate because you can fit them with glasses. I'll even give you this particular example, which is very important. Understand this. To a patient who's coming from 2200 to 2080 amblyopic, that is a tremendous achievement for them. Cannot say I will not do your surgery because they're not 2020. I have tons of patients hundreds of patients who at this juncture change their life because to them getting that 2080 is mind blowing. How do you know that? Refract the patient, simulate that patient with your optometrist, let them wear a contact glasses for a month, two months, whatever. Let them come back and say, doc, that is a tremendous improvement for you. If you see my videos that I teach with, I show myself refracting and I do a perceptive test, which is when you're refracting, you ask the patient, give me a scale of one to 10, how much better are you seeing from 2200 to your amblyopic 2080? That becomes an indication. You cannot say no to somebody because they are demanding. 100% of my patients are the most demanding in the world. That's why they fly. Here's what I'd say to surgeons. Only a demanding artist will appreciate your Mona Lisa. So you want a type A patient because we as doctors are type A. That's my pattern of thinking. And always you're not offering a surgery. You're letting a patient know that they should not wear glasses. Wearing glasses is like wearing a crutch. It is completely improper. 
But to wear it, if you're not correctable by surgery, I'm okay with that. So that's my thought process. Cannot say, oh, oh excuse me, I wear glasses. But my question is, why the hell are you wearing glasses? What disease do you have that I cannot fix? So the attitude we have to have as eye surgeons is, nobody should wear glasses or contacts. But they're wearing it either in the stage where they cannot have surgery or they had surgery and they were not corrected despite the techniques I've been teaching where you can fix any complication. LASIK ectasia is very easily corrected, but one should not get it. And as Dr. Ravi pointed out, in my experience of perhaps, the, again, the largest referral base of refractive complications in the world, the biggest cause is missed form first keratoconus. But then you don't do LASIK. You do a surface technique, you do ICL. You see, my point is having keratoconus is not a contraindication. In fact, I'm pushing the point that keratoconus is a refractive surgery, meaning every patient of keratoconus, no matter how advanced, must see 2020 without glasses. If you cannot reach that with surgery, having done the right surgery, <laughs> then optometrist again covers up with the scleral contacts and brings them to 2020. But to take a keratoconus patient, do a stupid cross-linking and keep their spine bent forever, wrong concept, wrong concept. If you cannot fix the spine first, you just disable the patient forever. So the mindset has to change. Surgery, there is no limits to the options we have. Ectasia can be corrected with numerous techniques, but one should not get into it without diagnosing. And as I mentioned to you in the start, even though we have all these technologies, I empower doctors, which is refract the patient and you'll find your keratoconus. You don't even need a topographer. These are important points to teach because young students, young surgeons, young optometrists stepping out into practice, <coughs> constantly emailing me, Dr. Gani, do I still need to buy these technologies? You need it, but not immediate. You first learn how to refract. Here's my statement. Refraction is a must for refractive surgeons. So any complication will be avoided if you know how to find the problem. Two, by not limiting yourself to just four or five surgeries, 48. Be a master chef. Do and design the meal to that person who's hungry. Stop giving them burgers and hot dogs and burritos. That's all we have. LASIK, smile, PRK. Nonsense. 23 laser techniques. So that's how you become safe and have a zero retreatment rate, zero complication rate. No, you don't guarantee any of this to the patient. You make sign their life away, correct? Important. But in your heart, you should know that what you're suggesting is absolutely the right thing for that patient. You don't offer. You're suggesting a plan, not an option. Yesterday, I just blew out all the doctors who talk this nonsense about multifocal and this, that, and how does the poor patient know how to decide what to take? You have to tell the patient, I have decided on a toric trifocal lens for you because of these optics. And I know you'll do well. That's why you're a doctor. So that's my take on situations like these. Thank you, Dr. Gulani. Dr. Nitin, you have something to say? Uh, I really appreciate what Dr. Gulani is talking about. But I have one clarification uh, so far as uh, the, the thinking process of the doctor is concerned. It much depends on the demography of the population, the economy of the country or the area where you are practicing, much depends on that. And uh, the, the level of education of the patient, this demography is quite different in India compared to other developed countries where where uh, you explain everything to the patient, you suggest everything to the patient, but their expectations after the surgery is like, my friend can see that I can't see, don't you have make them emetropic. So this, this level of understanding depends on the, you know, the demographic of the population. And that is why uh, we have little laid back attitude, you know, and that is justified. So let me, let me let me interrupt that. Let me interrupt that. I love your point, Dr. Nathan. I absolutely agree. Remember, I see a lot of complications from India and I've seen the patients and that's where I was trained. That's why I'm so passionate about sharing these concepts. So let me explain very important point. And this is about life in particular. I do not believe in external environment. Let me repeat and I'm sure you understand. I work in the world's most litigious country. I'll just stop there for a second so you understand the level of issues that a surgeon faces in the United States. Despite that, my patients are on Facebook. How come? And by most important, I don't advertise. 
that I'm the only practice perhaps in the world that doesn't advertise has a global clientele and each patient of mine is on Facebook, imagine. So it is a very high accountability practice. You're absolutely correct. The doctor has to face performance every day. I don't go to my institute and a patient is referred because I gave wine to somebody or took them out for lunch. I don't do that. Advertising is zero. They are flying because of results. So absolutely agree with you. But I'd also suggest, because there are a lot of young people watching us, is you have to change the environment. You tell the patient and you are the doctor. I absolutely believe that doctors have weakened themselves by becoming people who give options and are always scared of a lawsuit, always suggesting, keep your chest out, you're a doctor. Hey, Mr. Smith, you deserve surgery, this, 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 because that is what I believe. You came to me, I did not come to your house in a mobile van asking for you, number one. Number two, here is my reputation and abilities. It's out there for you. Number three, here's my performance record. Number four, sign on this consent form that says you will go blind, you could go blind, you can go blind, you should go blind. Important, that's integrity. No patient I've known till today has walked away because they signed 15 pages in my office because I'm very passionate, they know it. I'm very passionate about delivering vision and I made myself accountable sharing with my colleagues because I want you all to perform at this level, it's possible. You are very skilled, especially you guys in India extremely skilled. I've seen so many people come to me for fellowship, tremendous hands, but you have to have an attitude of a doctor. Doctor prescribes, does not give options. A waiter gives options. Ma'am, what will you have today? Right? So a doctor has to be extremely strong because a patient actually is looking up to you. They are expecting you to help them. Only thing we have to do is perform. So I agree with you with demographic, but I've given you my demographic, which should really make you think because these are very litigious patients. I remember again, 78% of my practice are second opinions and complication corrections. So imagine the patient flying to me is already pissed off at their surgeon. That is my practice every day. And I showed you the cases. I'm basically breaking this myth of this can't be done. This is too high. This is too irregular. Nonsense. I just showed you the results. And how do you know it's correct? My patients are posting on Facebook without incentive from me. That is the highest accountability. Even when I'm sleeping, these guys are writing about me. So it is so easy for you to publish a white paper and hide them in a graph. 50 did well, 20 did bad, so easy. My patients, you can see the face and connect with them and they'll tell you what's going on. So I agree with demographics, but I would encourage the doctors to take charge, powerful. And of course that has to have a backbone of integrity. You can't be schmoozing, advertising, doing deals and discounts. Very strong backbone performance. Patient must understand that doctor is the guy in charge. Doctor is the guy in charge. You are the master chef. Ingredients don't advertise. The company is already advertising for you, right? So-and-so lasers, so-and-so lenses. If you advertise, you're wasting your money. Think about it. Every time patients or doctors call me from India too, they keep calling me, how do you do your stuff? I'm like, it's very simple. Do the right thing. If you advertise the laser, for example, let's say, a lot of you I know do this robotic cataract surgery, correct? Now what happens to the public? You called it robotic, the patient's mind moves suddenly from Dr. Nitin, the amazing surgeon, or Dr. Ravi, the amazing refractive surgeon that moves to robot, the laser. Suddenly Ravi and Nitin make no difference. Patient will call your office and go, what price will you give me for that robot? You just lost everything. You lost everything. You're no longer Nitin, the 30 year I heard you practice for 30 years, right? Or Ravi, the brilliant refractive surgeon I just heard. There's no difference now between you. You are technicians. The patient has just put you in your place. And now your staff has to fight. Oh, what, what's that? 500 more? I, I, let me help you. Why? Why? But you just did it to yourself by calling robots and calling it advertising. Your advertisement, if you do advertising, I don't and I don't like it. If you do, you say, I'm 30 years into practice, damn it. You can't touch me. Look at my integrity. Look at my complication rate. That's why you're coming to me. And don't ask questions. I am the doctor here. Again, integrity and performance, then you can speak that way. So my whole take is, don't do these things. Patients come to you, I want that lens. Dr. Nitin, is that yes or no? Remember, patients come to you for cataract. Ravi, you do intraocular surgery, right? Yes. Don't patients come say, I want that lens, correct? I put the patient in place right there. I said, stop. I decide what you get. Stop. Oh, I want that lens I heard in the news. I'll decide that. 
Simple. Patient cannot be demanding. You are demanding. That's why you became an eye doctor, right? I mean, come on, man. We stood first among college people, thousands. That's why we became medical students. Remember how our parents celebrated when we became doctors? Why are we forgetting that? And when we went to med school, you topped and you became an eye surgeon or an optometrist. How amazing is that? Who can beat you? Tell me. Why have doctors become so, so meek, so scared, so I won't do this? Patient is demanding. Oh, you be more demanding, man. Sit straight and go, hey, this is what I want for you. This is my plan for you. No guarantees. Do you get that? Absolutely. And then perform. Blow them away. Let them fly their families to you. Take charge of your city, state, country, world. You don't have to be in a village somewhere. You know, come on. You could practice anywhere. Make the world fly with your pattern of performance. No one can beat that. Have I answered that, Nidhan? So no more. Demographic. <laughs> Tomorrow, and get to take care of corners patient to 2020. <laughs> 2010, sir. Not 2020, 2010. 2010. Make me happy, Ravi. Send me that, that report. Was, <laughs> that was I, I quite mean, a dynamite of a response. Indeed, we are blown away <laughs> by, by that, of course. And um, moving forward, I would like to ask you about the best and the worst experiences that you have had, uh, starting with Dr. Ravi Krishna. What was the best reaction that you have had from a patient during your years of experience? Uh, I had one patient uh, who, whose refractive error was around 25, and his age was around uh, 27 or 28. So uh, he had like before IPCL came into picture, like it was the uh, uh, time when ICL was there, which was correcting around 18 to 20. In India, this IPCL uh, was launched and they were uh, manufacturing the lens till around 30, 32 and all. So, uh, a patient had been to many hospitals and they had told him that like we can correct around 18 or 20 and remaining 5 whatever remains 5 or 6 for that you have to wear glasses. So then uh, I spoke to this care group people and uh, I came to know that they are ready to supply the IPCL for that power. So patient uh, initially was okay for that like uh, because everywhere they are told that you will not be correcting fully and you have to wear glasses so like uh, like uh, when i did the surgery immediately after surgery he was having almost i think six nine but he was little ambulopic but uh, his best corrected was happy so that was one of the happiest moment in my life uh, after treating that patient. Uh, worst, um, I, I had to rethink, let other panelists answer, so then I'll... Of course, we will get back uh, to you. Dr. Nitin, what was the best experience, reaction that you have received from your patient during your years of experience? When you are asking me one particular patient giving this re reaction, uh, let me go ahead and tell you that it's not one patient, it's all the patients are telling me so, you know, giving such a good remarks after the surgery. Of course. Uh, whether it is a cataract surgery as it has become a refractive surgery and when you employ all the modern gadgets to do the surgery, uh, when your surgery is image guided and optical biometers, web source. Uh, so you give very good expected results to the patient. Uh, so by and large, all of them are so very happy. Uh, but any well, certain they, they, experience they, they, that have has stood out among all of those experiences? One beautiful girl, very, very younger than me in the age, is asking me, will you marry me? Oh. <laughs> 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 when, did, when did this happen, sir? <laughs> uh, you just have to you know, laugh it out. But... You know, she was very happy. You know? I'm feeling so thrilled. I, I love you, doctor. You have done wonders. This and that. You know? <laughs> so what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have led to the bad experience. <laughs> 
<laughs> Coming to Dr. Arun, what, uh, um, as we could see from your presentation that you have had a lot of great experiences. So what was one experience that particularly stood Again, uh, all of them, I would actually agree, you know, being an eye surgeon is such a privilege. Um, first of all, you know, we don't do dirty stuff. You know, it's so clean. You sit down, you listen to music, you operate. It's just, and I, I'm biased. I, there's no profession like ours. Second, uh, as you've seen, yes, I have a lot of fun with my patients. Uh, if you see our Facebook, Instagram, I let them do anything with me, photographs. Uh, don't let them marry me, Dr. Nathan, no. But uh, <laughs> let them take pictures, have fun with me. I even do silly stuff like, if they're at a hotel, you know, many of our patients are out of town If they've come alone. Uh, I'll go with my wife and we literally, you know, have dinner with them and they are blown away. They keep taking pictures as we are eating dinner. So it's amazing. Lately, the South African girl with nystagmus and her eyes all over, and now she's all dressed up. She wants to be a model taking selfies. Um, I, I truly believe, and this is an important part of our discussion, optometry, ophthalmology, we are way beyond privileged. You know, you walk in dressed up into work, you don't have any nonsense, there is no bad fluids, there is no uh, odor, it's, it's just young, healthy or elderly, healthy people walking in. And there's one more thing I stress on a lot is learn from our patients. You know, I love to chat with them. People keep telling me, Dr. Ghani, people fly from all over the world, how, how much time? I spend 40 minutes, an hour. I refract each patient. I sit down, sometimes I'm having lunch and patient from Australia landed, I don't even know them yet. I share my sushi with them and I haven't even done their surgery. So I just do what a normal human being would do. I feel like going and, you know, someone couldn't afford my surgery. I did their surgery. I'll go and give them my leather jacket. Uh, I'll go to a bad part of town and just make them wear it. So I think we are so privileged to be doctors and then to be eye doctors and to share on such forums. And all of us have worked so hard. There's so much we have to give. And uh, to that point, back to Dr. Nitin, I'm reemphasizing because I want him to change his if you look back now, Doc, all the people who really emphasized their happiness to you were all type A. The more type A they were, the more they will thank you. Yeah. So hence, I want you to change. The more demanding the patient was, the more he will love you. And the more he will fly his family because they get it. You know, it's very easy painting walls. It's very difficult making frescoes on the top of the ceiling. And you're upside down. That is what we do. Take credit and take demanding patients because the demanding patient is looking for a demanding doctor <laughs> all the time. The equality is there. So I do believe in this a lot. If the patient is demanding, get even more charged because don't forget you were demanding. That's why you became an eye doctor. Don't forget. I keep teaching fellows the same thing every time I say, just use the mirror as your best guide. If you're ever scared, look at the mirror, look at what you achieved. How demanding were we, Dr. Nitin? Ravi, come on. Yes? Why are you scared of demanding person? Let them know that you're more demanding than them. You walk into a room, it should be a gush of radiance. Come on, 48 techniques. Who the hell told you you can't be fixed? Who was stupid enough to say you'll be corrected up to 10 and then you'll wear glasses? I'll give you half a crutch. Is that the answer? How silly do these things sound when people talk on stage? I took this patient from here to here. I'm like, shut up. Don't touch the patient until you can plan your 2020 plan. On Saturday, I spend four to five hours planning for 15 to 20 patients landing every week alone in the office. That's where my fellows learn. Surgery never should last more than six minutes. That's my rule, no matter how complex. You have to be that fast and agile, but the planning is ours. When you show up, you're having fun. People are taking videos, photos. They're doing difficult surgery that people said can't be done. Patients are walking out, smiling, dancing, taking photographs, selfies. That's what addicts you. That's what I say. Get addicted to your patient's smiles. So you got a long answer, but I think we are so privileged. Everything we do every day we do, not only if a patient appreciates, which they do, just going home, what a feeling. You change people's lives. Even a cancer surgeon doesn't do that. Remember, someone staying alive with blindness is worse than dead. How dangerous a job do we do in a three centimeter eyeball in a breathing patient? We operate. One mistake, it's a $3 million lawsuit. How amazing is that? Right? 
I have a truly 78% of my practice. Imagine every second patient of mine comes in with a thick file, sometimes with attorneys, mostly with their surgeons. That's my routine day. How dare then do I speak like this? Because performance, you're scared of nothing. Performance, you tell all the attorneys, sit outside, damn it, no one comes in. I do that with movie stars. I do that with uh, football players, pro professional. I show them who's the real star. And then you do the other side of life, which is you donate, you help people, you do pro bono work. But don't forget, you are the master chef. Don't forget that. Oh, I'm doing this surgery. I'm going to do this lens for you. Shit. That's nonsense. I'm going to go into my kitchen and make a meal that will blow you away. You're not going to tell me what ingredient to use. You cannot. I am not sure if I... I should be asking you uh, if you've had any worse or any bad experience during your years of practice because thank God, have none. you? <laughs> thank God. None. <laughs> uh, Dr. Nitin, you have um, now you have uh, shared with us the beautiful uh, story of uh, your patient uh, whose heart you have respectfully broken. So you also have had uh, no bad experience regarding any of the refractive surgery procedures that you have done. He avoided the bad experience. No. <laughs> you are right. There he is. What Dr. Arun says is correct. We avoid. There are a lot of filtered out, you know, so you don't have the bad experience. <laughs> right, you are. Uh, Dr. Ravi Krishna, any uh, bad experience that you have? Yeah, in cataract, yes, I had some couple of uh, cases, but refractive, I don't remember. Touch wood till now, no. Uh, thank you. Nobody proposed uh, to you, Ravi. That's, that's <laughs> not good. <laughs> sir, I keep chatting with all my patients like you, sir. No, what's up? We are uh, nearing the end of the session. So uh, I would just uh, ask you to highlight how an optometrist can choose their career path in refractive surgery procedures, starting with Dr. Nitin. Well, I said that I can't operate my refractive surgery without the help of my optometrist. So one can choose entirely refractive surgery as a career in optometry because there is a huge workload to be you know, carried out by the optometrist to deliver the final result. Like doctor is spending so much of time himself. Dr. Gulwani said that he refracts the patient because he doesn't trust the optometrist. But if an optometrist does a good job and convinces Dr. Gulani that, yes, I am there. And Dr. Gulani is convinced that, yes, my optometrist is doing the perfect job. Then that is the achievement of an optometrist. You know, that kind of dedication of an optometrist can really do wonders. It's a big role you can play. Thank you, Dr. Nitin. Uh, I will come back to Dr. Arun, but first I would like to ask Dr. Ravi Krishna how an optometrist can choose their career path in refractive surgery procedures. See, uh, there are two terminologies. One is called refractionist, other one is optometrist. Yes. So most of the optometrists have become refractionist. That's true. So they just be in some of the optical shop or some of the institute uh, where they'll be mainly concentrating on the refraction only. So according to me, optometrist should have an exposure to all the instruments, all the machines available, all the OT procedures, especially refractive part. Uh, and in addition to the refraction. So this is what I uh, personally feel that they should be learning about the missions which are there in the hospital, all the accessories like refract, it may be refractive, it may be a glaucoma, it may be a retina, it may be a cataract plus refractive OT. So this is what I want them to learn and go ahead in their life and become a full-fledged optometrist, not just a refractionist. Thank you, Dr. Ravi Krishna. Dr. Arun Gulani, uh, what do you have to say regarding this? Uh, first of all, uh, I refract the patient not because I do not trust the optometrist. It's because <laughs> the way I teach surgeons, it is about being accountable. I'm a fashion designer. That's my second passion. So I believe you cannot not measure the person and start tailoring. Then you're ready to blame somebody. I'm ready to take the blame. So I always teach surgeons. I say, keep your chest out all the time. Be proud of what you do because 
responsibility also comes with rights, right? So take credit, but also be there to listen to something. So every patient knows I refracted them. So I'm always ready for anyone to dare challenge me because I did it, I'm responsible. So that's my point of refracting. Second, for optometrists, like Dr. Ravi very rightly said, you know, there's no point, uh, some may want it, maybe that's the business pattern of being a refractionist. I truly believe, and this is what I tell eye surgeons, I'm saying the same thing, get addicted to your patients. Just go to a hospital, okay? <laughs> I don't want to walk over our colleagues, but uh, there's no profession like ophthalmology. Just make them walk through the medical road, there'll be smells everywhere. Go to surgical, there'll be blood everywhere. Go to gynecology, you'll run away. Go to orthopedics, then go to ophthalmology department. It's mind blowing. Everybody's quiet, elegant, and we talk words that you know, sound like Greek to everybody. You sound really intelligent. So my point is, get them addicted to the profession first, one. Two, let them see the post-op patients. How amazing that we do these surgeries, um, there is no stitches, the patient's eyes look crystal clear on my pterygium cases when I do make them walk to the mirror next day, it's crystal clear, sparkling white eyes, get them addicted to the result. Then show them how they can be part of this journey of the patient. That's when you want the optometrist to understand their power. Their power is not just refraction, it's how to look at the patient, how to present that patient, how to take part in surgery, how to follow up with the patient, how to take care of vision if it wasn't fully achieved. All that is the optometrist role. But start, what I call it forwards, most people call it backwards, is get addicted first to the profession and the outcomes. Then the optometrist will come and go, why can't I do this? Right? And look at the techniques that are coming out now for optometry, it's, it's amazing. Spheral contact lenses has changed the whole game, right? It literally is gonna be, any cornea can be corrected to 2020. Look at that power. Second, your involvement in diagnostics. Today you can diagnose to a level that you can literally tell an eye surgeon what you found. Three, your ability to deliver at so many levels. Cross-linking is a procedure ophthalmologists don't even need to do. I mean, come on. All these videos of these doctors staring down a damn light for 30 minutes, is that any talent? Nothing needed. So it is important to realize it's a great time for optometry from diagnostics to performance. And of course, you are the strong force in ophthalmology. Absolutely. And ophthalmologists are doing and executing at a very high level. By the same token, I want everybody to understand performing surgery is not like glasses. You know, I hear this a lot. Many eye surgeons tell me, well, optometrists make it look like we do simple stuff. You know, I'll send you to this guy, he'll do surgery, he'll come back. No, I tell them, tell them then to join you in the hunt. Let them feel the beats of the drums. Let them feel the heart very high rhythm as you're chasing or getting chased during surgery. We know as surgeons what we go through in that three minutes, right? Just when you feel the nucleus is gonna go down, that feeling, and yet you come out with 2020. You look like a master, but nobody else understands that if they don't understand surgery. So that is an equal opposite reaction of optometry I want in ophthalmology. It's not just I'm gonna send you there for a swoosh cataract and you'll be back. That swoosh cataract is intense in that three minutes while the patient's breathing and the eye is moving and they are apprehensive. So I believe start an optometrist, let them first know the potentials that they have. It's not just glasses, it's so much more. And second, get addicted to the profession. Very well thank said. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arun. We have now arrived towards the end of the panel discussion. I would like to extend a heartfelt thanks to all of our panelists for a wonderful discussion today, as well as great insights. I hope our audiences listening to us today have also enjoyed the discussion. So before wrapping up, I would like to ask our panelists about anything that would like to add uh, that we might have missed out today or any last words that they have for our audiences, starting with uh, Dr. Nitin. I don't have to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ravi Krishna? Yeah, uh, I learned a lot from Dr. Arun today. So I've heard his talk many minutes before, but today a lot of encouraging words he has given for 
I are young surgeons as well as for the optometrist. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, coming to Dr. Gulani, uh, what uh, would be your uh, any last words for our, our audiences or anything that you would like to add that we might have missed today? Just be amazing. You already are. <laughs> As optometrist, scale every height and actually put every ophthalmologist on the line. If you can refract to 2020, you want the patient back 2020 or 2010, Ravi, right? Of course. Sure, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Love you all. I've got to go now. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Right. Dr. Thank you. Gulani. Thank you, Manashvi. Very nicely conducted. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank Frankly. you so much. Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Nitin, sir. Thank you, Arun. Thank sir. you. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your, all thank your you. kind words. And again, thank you to Dr. Arun Gulani, Dr. Nitin Malkan, and Dr. Ravi Krishna for joining me here today on the For Optum Optometry Updates Expert Live Panel Discussion in association with ASCO. This session is live on YouTube and shall remain on the platform if any of our viewers wish to revisit it or have missed any part of the discussion. I would also like to thank our audience for being here with us and for the love and support that you have shown to us and For Optum. We will be back in future with more programs, sessions, panel discussions, and so on. On that note, I would like to end the session here. Stay tuned for more programs by Foroptom. You can also visit us at www.foroptom.com. Also join us on any social media. Feel free to drop any suggestions or ideas for the channel on our email info at foroptom.com. This is your host, Manashvi, signing off today. Stay home, stay safe, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitin, Dr. Ravikrishna, for joining me.